Okay. Well, first of all, thank you all for inviting me. Um, can I, I'm going to ask you all a question first, and that is, what is the makeup? Are there students here or are there professionals and instructors? I mean, what, what is the makeup of the room? Is there, is it, or is it kind of uh, eclectic that way? We, uh, our members are a combination of students, professionals within the central Ohio area. And, uh, they're diverse in regards from uh, application from you know, design, typographers, video people, uh, illustrators. But it's, it's essentially a pretty good uh, group of visual communicators uh, within central Ohio. All right. I appreciate that. Well, I'm John. Um, I've done multiple things in my career. Started out as uh, an illustration student and an illustrator. Um, I was very fortunate um, <laughs> as far as information came to me easily. I don't know if I if I took to it easily or if I understood it quickly, but it came to me easily because of who my father was. Uh, my father was Mark English, uh, kind of an iconic American illustrator. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of is my father and I developed the Illustration Academy when I was about 30 years old, and it's been around for 26 years. And um, unfortunately, why we're all doing this online right now, and I'm not there, is because of the coronavirus. And for the first time in 26 years, I haven't been able to hold the Illustration Academy, at least in an um, on-ground environment. I'm fortunate that for the last 10 years, I've been developing online delivery, online classes, and I've developed this product, Visual Arts Passage, is kind of as a sister school in the online delivery for the Illustration Academy. And so, <clears throat> educationally right now, it's these two, two directions. Obviously, the Illustration Academy is in hibernation and kind of on hold right now, but um, we're, we're, we're making the best of it. We've offered a, a digital solution to the academy for this summer, uh, or starting. Actually, it starts next week, uh, the twenty fifth. Uh, these are the speakers that are involved in our program, um, and what we're doing. And I'll explain it further. Basically, what we're doing is we're letting somebody take a a ten week class in our online program, and on top of the normal ten weeks of class, the live delivery that is done in Zoom and use a multi multitude of different technologies to communicate all week long. Um, uh, we're doing a live Sunday class. And these Sunday, these people that are in listed here, Bill Sienkiewicz and Chris Payne and Francis Vallejo, the great Ian McKay, concept designer, Carlo Ortiz, Vanessa Del Rey, Wesley Burt, George Pratt, Brent Watkinson, John Foster, myself, Audrey Benjaminson, Sterling Hunley, and Edward Kinsella. Um, and there's a few others, but they are going to be delivering Sunday uh, lectures and demonstrations as part of our delivery for the summer. So we feel like we have covered a good chunk of our students that we had. We had about 75 students that have uh, had ap uh, applied and been accepted to the program, and about half of them have chose to go forward with us, which um, which is amazing because 20% uh, of them came from outside of the country and they couldn't travel. There's no way they could travel. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited that we have a solution. Um, part of the academy has been a community and it's the community that drives everything. Uh, I was just mentioning before we start our next, we've been doing the series of free lectures uh, called illustration isolation. If you do, if you follow hashtag illustration isolation to either uh, on Facebook or uh, Instagram, uh, you'll end up on our our pages, and you can see that we've been uh, delivering a series of lectures and demonstrations for. I think we've done our for, our fourth. Uh, Sterling Hunley last week. The week prior to that was John Foster. Prior to that was George Pratt. Prior to that was myself. Um, we're also doing an open drawing night, which Jeremy has been showing up and evidently bringing his family too. <laughs> um, and it's an open drawing session where we have identified a group of our, 
our community groups of our community that are really interested in drawing. It's all clothed figure, so it's appropriate for all ages. And we just thought, man, this would be a great solution. Both of these would be for people that are bored, um, offer something to our community that we're well equipped to do. And on the Thursday nights, we spotlight last, we had uh, Chris Payne and Bill Cove and uh, George Pratt and uh, Don Kilpatrick, all mic and had their videos so they could share their drawings. Uh, people can watch them draw. And then we post uh, post images. We, we we have a live we actually have a live model, and um, in a in a photography studio, and we're telling them what to do. We're lighting having the photographer light them, and shooting reference uh, the person who we're spotlighting their video. So if it's Chris Payne or George Pratt or myself, they're directing the model to do what they wanted to, and then we draw. We do twenty minute poses. It's really fun. And it's more just a community outreach to do something good for our audience and for our for our community. Um, what we've been doing with uh, uh, um, with all of the work that we've been creating for our weekend lectures and demos. I did the first week. This is the painting I did um, during my first lecture or for my first demonstration or my demonstration uh, three four Sundays ago. Um, and we're selling all these and we have sold everything so far and we've donated all the proceeds to uh, global giving the coronavirus relief fund. So it's like we're, we're doing. Things to keep our audience interested and things that I think are good for the good for the world. Uh, this is George Pratt George. This was George's demo. If you go to the website, our website, uh, the uh, illustration isolation. Um, our visual arts passage website, you can get to there. You can see all of the, the demonstrations, all of the videos are, are there. I don't think Sterling's is post, posted yet. George is amazingly fast. He did these two both in a three hour lecture demonstration. John Foster's, Sterling Hunley's, and then this coming week is going to be uh, CF Payne. And I was saying before this, right now we have Almost 1400 people signed up to see CF paints uh, demonstration. Our audience is pretty large. We've been doing this for a long time. Um, and the people connected, the artists connected to us have, you know, they all have big voices. So it's allowed us to um, reach a lot of people. So that's that's one of the things I'm working on right now. Um, it's a series of <laughs> a group of drawings. Um, if you if you hashtag illustration isolation, either the Facebook group or Instagram group group each night, I think last Thursday, which was last night, we had 200 plus drawings posted and tagged to our Facebook group of people that did them uh, during the night. We had over 300 people join us last night. Don Kilpatrick, this is Chris Payne, Don Kilpatrick, uh, Don's the next student of mine and the chair of uh, uh, for creative studies, good illustrator, Bill Cove, George Pratt, of course, uh, amazing drawer, amazing artist all the way around, great graphic novelist, probably my best friend in the world, me and John Foster. Um, fabulous artist. So you can find us at Illustration Isolation. It, it might be fun for you to, to, to join us and fill your time with it. Okay. <laughs> What I guess the main part of what I do and what I've done is this is uh, make artwork. And I probably would have been more suited. What I was interested in was all the painters my father was looking at. And I probably would have been more suited as a representational painter, um, representational gallery work was really not an option when I got out of school. Everything was still driven by abstract expressionists. Um, over time, in the first maybe 15 years of my career, it became very popular. Malcolm Lipke, Robert Heindel, um, Dan Schwartz, really good illustrators that kind of bridged the gap between the fine art world and the illustration world. These are obviously illustrations as a book cover and made into a poster. It's been bought and sold a number of times. Um, cover of Newsweek, but most of what I did as an illustrator was likeness. And you know, I'm gonna talk about personal development and per personal point of view a little bit further on in my talk. My, 
personal way that I work, uh, what I did as an illustrator, I don't think I ever was really that unique or that um, uh, had established that much of a voice. Um, it was always moody. It was always trying to capture, you know, a, an image, a likeness of some somebody, tell a simple story, conceptually not that strong. Um, but I, I really liked the, the drawing and painting aspect of it and the picture making side of it. Um, I think my voice, I developed myself a little bit more um, as a painter, as doing the, the landscape work and now some of the figurative work that I do. Um, that it has more of a personal personality to it, more about what I, the way I see picture making. Um, and I would hope, <laughs> I should have said this up front, I would hope that somebody would ask me a question or two along the way. It would be easier for me to, to talk or to, to fill the time. I'm not going to show a huge number of my images, but this, these are, this is what I, I've learned to do. This is what relates to the way I teach, the way I understand picture making. Um, it's going a lot of different directions. This is a series of, you know, from a series of local paintings around Kansas City, uh, looking, trying to get a different view of the city. Kansas City, unlike most river towns, they've kind of turned their back to the river and they developed the opposite direction. They don't have, for a long time, they didn't have anything that incorporated the river. And so I, I kind of took a different view of it and tried to visually incorporate it. Now the city's doing much better that way. They're developing around the river with parks and all kinds of stuff. But I you know, when I first started doing this, I was going to the riverfront with a machete and literally chopping trees and, and bushes down to get, to get great views of the city. And now you can just take paths or bike paths or whatever and walk there. Um, do a lot of, I have a gallery in Colorado. A lot of the, a lot of my teachings based on drawing um, and pure picture making that the, the skill sets that make up what you need to be a good visual communicator. Uh, drawing, I like to, I like, I teach figure drawing is how my father taught me figure drawing was to identify the shape first. These are all, <clears throat> these are all 20 minute poses on large pieces of paper. They're, well, I think the paper is 28 inches tall um, by 18 inches wide. <clears throat> and um, I work on a mid-tone, I work with new pastels. It's very immediate, very fast, but to me it relates much more to picture making. It's identifying a shape and an, of, of an object. In this case, it happens to be the figure. And I really kind of assume that picture making is in totality. It's a collection of shapes and it's an artist's job to control the shapes and developing in line, which also defines shape, but not near as well as silhouette and, and value. And I think this makes more, it's a better practice. It's not just a practice about learning to draw better. It's a practice in seeing its shape, identifying the, the, the value so that it explains, is this a dark figure on a, against a light background or a light figure against a dark background? And that's really the basic math about becoming a picture maker. I know everybody thinks that, you know, picture making can be very complicated, but, you know, if you sit down to draw your, an object on a page, you have a dark pencil and a white piece of paper, you do have to make the decision once you decide what you're going to draw and where it's going to go. The first thing you have to decide is how it's going to be legible. And so is this going to be light against dark or dark against light? And you play that like a chess game all the way through your picture making. And as you compose, you know, teaching, understanding the three value thumbnail becomes your, your best weapon in becoming a composer. But I think teaching drawing this way helps you to start to see, to start to see things in shape and identify shape. Um, so it's, 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 um, it's a little different than most anatomy classes. And this certainly isn't about anatomy. In fact, 
my dad kind of devised this way of drawing for students along the way. And my dad, <laughs> he was a phenomenal drawer, uh, just amazing. And he couldn't tell you anything about anatomy. He couldn't tell you a bone or a muscle. It was always the back of the arm or the chest or the leg, the front of the leg, the pad of the back of the leg. Anatomy was not his thing, but he was a, he understood it really well. He understood weight transfer, he understood gesture, but it was all through observation and practice and just repeating it. Different type of drawing that I do, a lot of portrait work that I did as an illustrator, learning to design a portrait just in black and white, create interest with mark making and line and, and shape and let it read as a single, as, as a complete picture. This is something I always give students pretty early on because it's a difficult thing to do uh, and to make it interesting. Um, and especially when you're trying to carry a likeness through something. So, you know, you, you want to get the interest, but it's got to have a likeness to it. Um, it's a series, and I end up doing a lot of these things. Um, kind of a group of a small group. These paintings are usually, I never work smaller than 14 by 14. Just, I don't like to paint that small, but these are all demonstrations for students from start to finish. And when I demonstrate, I'll show you process just real quickly here in a second. And these are all usually you know, hour and a half to two hours to make a painting. But I have a plan when I go into it, as most illustrators do. Uh, I have a plan when I start a painting my process real simply. I, I always look for, especially in landscape, anything that I, well, anything that I'm doing, I'm looking for shape relationships, inspiration and things that inspire me uh, with, with shape and how things work to, how they work well with each other or they don't work with each other. And it's usually something I see as I'm looking at landscape or cityscape that excites me with a, with a group of shapes together. And then I'll photograph it a ton of photography. I'll photograph something and then I'll go in even with Photoshop now and correct my photographs, change crop, change values, take things out, put things in, move things around, and then I then I draw it. And I and, and I used to go directly from a 35 millimeter shot that I took and just start drawing. But it I can get I can get there so much faster by cropping and changing values of things in Photoshop. Um, it's a great tool, <clears throat> but I have a purpose with it. Um, the, this is from a trip I took to Montana last year. And this was right at the end of the trip. And my wife was barely talking to me. I went with my son and my, and his girlfriend. They're both 18 years of age. And we went and spent 10 days and went to the parks, went to through Idaho and Montana, parts of, but then there's things, places I hadn't seen before. Um, driving across Northern Wyoming, which is gorgeous, uh, I had shot 4,000 pictures in the previous 10 days. And <laughs> my wife was done with it. And we wanted to get, she wanted to get to the monuments in, um, in South Dakota. And so she just said, you gotta quit taking pictures. And my battery ran out in my SLR camera. And I thought, okay, this is great. It's the middle. That I just have to drive. There's not a whole lot. When I started driving, there wasn't anything that interesting. The sun was really high. It was in the summer. And so there was no great shadows. As the day started progressing, I started getting back into the mountains and the foothills. And the light became lower. And everything became really interesting. And so I asked my wife to take my iPhone and just pointed to her. Uh, pointed where I wanted her to shoot, and that's what this all this reference is. I shot hundreds. She shot hundreds of them, and she's actually really proud that she shot a bunch of reference that I'm actually using now to do paintings from. Um, she's a she's a very good designer. Uh, she's a, been a designer at Hallmark Cards for thirty plus years, and this is really my process. You know, I start with photography, the photo that you saw, then I I change the photography. I mean, this was a photo, I moved mountains around, I did all kinds of things to get 
an interest of something, some a dominant shape that other shapes supported. This is my little thumbnail that I even redrew that, moved some things even more, and then I redraw on my board. And it's the drawing process where I discover that I get my shapes right. Um, this was an older shot, a shot with 35 millimeter. 35 millimeter. Um, I have to say, anybody that's, I'm in my late 50s, and I started with a camera shooting an SLR 35 millimeter camera. And it was expensive. The cameras were expensive, but it was a, it was expensive to process the film, to buy the film. It took days to get it back at times. You know, I remember when 24 hour and one hour photo, you know, it kept getting faster and faster. And one hour photo was, I thought, the end of the world because as an illustrator, I needed everything quickly. Um, but I was very careful when I took the pictures because of the expense when I was starting out value the difference between photography a point and shoot like with a <coughs> excuse me with um, an iphone is you don't use the viewfinder most people don't they point and shoot framing pictures framing putting a box around everything even when you're drawing in your sketchbook putting it into a box you're thinking about division of space and scale and overlap and all the things that make up good picture making well i think i learned a lot by not taking those pictures and just spending all the time looking through the frames. Um, this is like a little thumbnail that I do a painting from. Again, these are still demonstrations. These aren't like complete paintings. It's like, I think that's a, a 14 by 20 painting. I tried to accomplish, I try to do, a de when I do demonstration, I always do the thumbnail with, before I do the painting. I show them what I'm gonna, how I make the process. Um, the, the piece that, uh, I did for the a few Sundays ago for Global Relief Fund that we sold. Um, it started with this piece of photography that my wife sh shot. Going, I was probably going 75, 80 miles an hour, um, and I was amazed at how much information was in these panoramic shots that came off my iPhone. This is where I took it. I I, I revert all my photography to black and white. Um, because I don't confuse color with with value, um, and I and I start I start all my artwork I start all my paintings with just the thought of value. Color is a secondary thing for me, and so I'm redesigning the shapes of the mountains. I'm taking trees out, moving things around. It gives me a good start, good inspiration. Here's another version of the same came from the same place, but very different picture, um, different design of the mountains. But then I. Then I draw everything. I redraw it. I re. I. I. I was consciously thinking about what could be a better shape of my trees. I want. I knew I wanted to isolate on these trees, and I wanted there, there to be an atmospheric perspective as this painting stepped back, um, as it went back in space. But the makeup, the dark and light pattern that I try to accomplish, kind of in an abstract way, is really, really important to me. And then I even go to the trouble. Like I draw it again. At times I've projected my drawings. Um, I, I don't like doing that as much because I don't, uh, I never project a photograph, but I would project my drawings at times. And, and, I, and at the time, and I really don't feel like I lose anything when I do that. It's fast, but it only took me about five or 10 minutes to draw this anyway. And then I get one more time that I can go through and I think about all the shapes of the trees. You know, what, you know, I'm trying, I'm looking for organic quality, things that don't repeat. My understanding of design is, is uh, I think that the interest in design comes from variety and, and in organic qualities that nature offers. It's a random, it's, nature is the perfect random, randomizer, the ultimate randomizer. And looking, and looking at things, looking at a shape, and trying it to make it interesting. Um, I mean, I, I know students always question me when I say, well, your shapes aren't very interesting. And it's because there's a lot of similarity to it. Get variety to it, turn a, turn a head to the side, a portrait, um, pure profile. You get a really simplified shape on the back and a lot of contour on the front. That's an interesting shape. And so not trying to have a diversity of contours to a shape 
to me, makes it interesting. Um, scale, dominance, all those things that uh, that bring variety to it. And and I like to think the picture I make is a lot different than what I initially saw. They don't look like replications of, of what I saw, especially the color. Um, I did this painting. This is almost all primarily with palette knife, and I had to do it very fast. I had to do it's I think it's 16 square, and I had to do it in about two hours of painting. So it had to be it had to be done pretty quickly. Um, this is where I work. The things that are most important to me, my drawing board, <laughs> the way my drawing board works. I love my drawing board. I love my lights. They, I used to have a very sophisticated, expensive lighting system, and I bought these. at. I just moved into this space. I'm in the process of uh, building a studio right now. My wife and I moved um, six months ago, eight months ago, and we had not a large family, but we had three children downsized to a bigger house <laughs> in a huge yard. We, have, uh, we live in Kansas City in the suburbs, but we have almost two acres, which is a, a big yard for our neighborhood. And I wanted, uh, I just fell in love with this. The whole house is stone from ground up all the way to the roof. And so I'm working in the basement right now. And I went out and I didn't want to permanently install these lights that I had color corrected, really fantastic light setup. So I went to Lowe's and got these LEDs for $49 a piece. And they're amazing. They're better. They're, I, I like them better than the lighting system I had. Uh, my drawing board I built, it moves it, I can change the angle, you can see it's propped up right here. And then of course, I got my the caricature that Chris painted of my father. See the one he did of me way back in the back. Um, Chris is a very dear friend of mine. And we traded pieces. and He's just been a wonderful supporter of the things. He's been teaching with me for since the very first Illustration Academy. And just magnificent artist and a great guy. Um, my uh, palette and my tabaret. Did somebody have a question? Anyway, um, my palette, my tabaret, and my most important studio piece of material is my dog. And I spend a lot of time by myself painting when I'm not teaching or I'm not building educational things. I'm by myself and, and he has been a great asset to me. <laughs> uh, he's only about a year old now and he just entertains me constantly. Um, personal point of view and influences. Hey John, do you mind if I ask you a quick question? You can ask me all you want. Yeah. Um... Well, Jeremy had a good one while you're still talking about your process. Um, what, what do you think about, um, what's the importance of experimentation for you? Um, thinking about like materials and I, I know you mentioned something about how well, you, you start with either dark and then you bring in light or you, you, you start with a, a kind of a white background and then you bring in the color. Uh, I start with the midtone always. And that board, that drawing that you saw on that board up here, I almost always start with a midtone because then I don't have to worry about light. And then the first thing I do is I block everything in. Even on an oil painting, most of the time I block everything in acrylic. I block my darks and I do my draw. I go over this with acrylic afterwards. Completely start to finish the demonstration of me doing this is videoed on that website right now. You can you can look at it. It's the only way I could get there that fast and Doing a complete piece in two hours is a difficult thing. And I use a lot of, I paint very wet into wet. Well, I do multiple things, things that I've done in the past. This is with paint sticks and oil crayons um, and dry brush oil paint. You can see the color of the canvas of the board coming through. I quickly painted all of this. I just blocked it in with, with dark acrylic. Because if I use a lot of palette knife, it scrapes to, it takes the paint completely off and leaves a white spot. So I just want to, I just block things in quickly with acrylic. I do multiple experiments. This is a pretty straight up oil painting. So is this. Material wise, this is wax, cold wax. 
paint sticks, all kinds of things. Um, it's very, it's, uh, I start it with acrylic. I go to oil. I use, I, I use, um, make the paint very transparent and very thick with, with wax, wax medium. Um, you can see the texture and the mark making in this thing. This is a big paint and it has a lot of, of tactile surface to it. Some of these are, these are, this is done with, with uh, paint sticks and oil crayons. This is a four by four foot square piece. Um, I did a whole series of them for a tennis academy. I've been, been a tennis jock my whole life. And this one's uh, four by six feet. Um, and they're done that way. They're done with paint and paint sticks. Uh, they have a lot of surface to them, a lot of texture to them. Experimenting is incredibly important for an artist. And my dad used to say that the best thing for an artist is to have a full trash can and um, try lots of different things, explore. You don't know what's gonna happen. Um, it's kind of been my mentality in a way. You know, I, I want my, my painting, I want them to have a feel that's different from other people's, you know? Um, you know, th there's a danger in doing pretty, pretty picture landscape. My, my landscapes, they, they have to have a crudeness about them for them to be good, I think, or else they become very sweet feel like a postcard. I don't want my work to look that way. I want it to have an edge to it. So there's a crudeness about it that, that's really important to me. Back to my a, a few influences here. Obviously, I'm going to show you a few pieces of my father. I can't think of another artist that maybe it covered as much ground. Maybe I, I obviously know him better than any other artist that I know. But he covered so much ground as an artist. He did things. This is even actually he had a, a completely different phase before he was doing things like this, where it was almost impressionistic painting. The thing that he did, the things that he did for the uh, women's magazines. Um, he was just a, a stellar painter and a great designer. He tried anything. He worked with tar. He worked with. I watched him <laughs> try to paint with a a caulk gun of running paint through a caulk gun too. I've, I've seen him try to do almost anything. He was amazing at, and the way he explored. So he did a lot of collage later on in life, but he was just a stellar drawer. And when I talk about point of view and influences, um, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to cover both at the same time. Point of view is so important, especially as an illustrator, because you know, to stand out, to separate yourself from everybody else is very important. Um, so let me get through some of my dad's work here. I, 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 uh, his ability to do so many different things always astounded me. And his ability to try. He did pure, he did pure abstract work. A lot of people don't even know. And he was good at it. And the, the, the thing that I love about it was I could still tell he did it. It had his design sense to it. It had so much, it was always, he was in every painting he did. That's like the ultimate challenge as an artist is to link everything together. And the importance of it as an illustrator, I'll talk about as a little bit of my talk towards the end, is that the value of developing yourself with unique voice. This is Bernie Fuchs. My dad's best friends were Bernie Fuchs and Bob Heindel, Fred Otnes, Alan Coburn. And I was, thankfully, I wish I wish I would have been smarter as a child. And I didn't start making artwork, so even start drawing until I was like 16. My dad worked really, really hard. I was not interested in doing that. <laughs> I was interested in playing games. Um, as I said, I was a kind of forever jock and athlete. And, and, um, he, uh, he worked all the time. He was a great dad. I spent time with him, but he constantly worked. And that's one of the reasons he was so good. Um, but his, his, the exposure I had to artists, I mean, a couple of my best friends uh, growing up were Bob Heindel's sons, Toby and Troy Heindel. And 
we went to the same high school. Bob Hindell was an amazing talent. <clears throat> and I had, I had access to all this stuff. And <laughs> that was probably one of the reasons I was so surprised when I, I actually taught at the Kansas City Art Institute for a year. And I, I did not fit well. I had a point of view that was very different than theirs. Um, I thought that they didn't treat illustration as an art form. I always considered it an art form. I thought the best of the people who couldn't say that wouldn't say that Gary Kelly's not a great artist. Um, and he treats his what he does as his art form. That's why it's at such a high level. One of the reasons. But these are these are people that influenced me immensely, helped me. I, 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 Gary was one of the first people I called with the Illustration Academy. I got really excited when every, like everybody I called agreed to do it. And I, I look back at it now and I think, well, they agreed to do it because my dad was doing it. Um, and I don't care. <laughs> I'm just happy I became good friends with them all and, and uh, still continue to teach with them. Anita Kuntz, incredible voice. Great picture maker, but her ideas just blow me away. Chris Payne, amazing talent. Can you imagine getting that job? Have the Wyeth family contact you and do a portrait of Andy Wyeth for his 90th birthday. That would scare me. He's one of the few people that could pull it off. Gorgeous piece. Okay, I'm gonna, I still have a few minutes, right? I got 15 minutes, I can still talk about how I see developing yourself and why it's important to develop. First, think about the biggest mistake that I see most young artists make, students or professionals, is they don't know who they're building their portfolio for. They haven't identified who they want to work for. Ultimately, your portfolio is the thing that represents you. It's a, it is a job interview anytime everybody anybody sees it. I know a lot of art directors. Um, Art directors don't pursue new talent. New talent to them is something they just seen in the industry. They don't spend a lot of time pursuing new talent. It's your job as a young artist to pursue them, is to get in their mind. To do that, to start all of this, to of the way I think about educating an artist, is you have to you have to have the have the student buy into what they want to do. What part of the industry, what type of illustrator do they want to be? Now illustration and concept art. There's a bunch of gray area. Some of the best concept artists I know do illustration, um, vice versa. Um, and they're good picture makers. Um, but you got to know the function of your audience and what they're looking for. You got to know what they know. Um, ultimately, you have to think about how an art director hires an artist to really understand the process. And so you have to think about an art director reads a story a world building brief, whatever it is, um, a, a, a book, a story. And while they're reading it, they're thinking, who would have, who could I hire? Who would be the person to convey what this story and align the visual with the narrative or the concept? Um, and if you think about that, you have, to, you have to think about, okay, so an art director, and I've spoken to some really great art directors that have verified this with me. It's something that they do that's like this, the, the people with identity, that's why your voice is so important. People that have identified themselves, they have a chance of getting a project given to them because a much better chance, because they're in the back of that art director's mind of somebody that does something. And if it happens to pair or match that particular assignment, they'll reach out to you. And so if you're thinking about building a portfolio, think about your audience first. Identify your audience, know their needs, know the function, know the difference if you want to do it, be a cover artist, know the difference between what co a cover is a very different thing than an interior piece. Function is really important. And then it has to resonate with, with the art director. 
know what they know, meaning for somebody to identify or to judge illustration and determine if you're the right person okay, or, or look at you or to, to realize that you're even doing a good job with your illustrations for you to look at it and to say, oh, that's a great illustration. You have to know the parameters. And so don't don't work on don't show art directors things they don't understand. Show them in the in 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 things they're going to recognize and they're going to resonate with them as being okay. I can I can discern this is a great cover because I've read that book. So you like as a cover artist, you work in the stories that you either work in a story that everybody knows, which can be very tricky, or you work in the stories you know they've already worked on. And when they see your illustration, when they see your visual solution. They'll, do, they'll be able to make a objective decision if you've done a good job with it. You can't judge illustration or design unless you you know the parameters. So you got to think you got to think like they do. Now, this is a process we have our students go through. We've been going through it at the Illustration Academy for years, and we have we have them go through halfway through our our online classes, where they have to buy in. It starts with having them identify three artists follow those artists all the way to the venues and companies, publishers that they, they work for, and ultimately who the art directors are. It's the art directors, that's how you determine. And everybody's list is slightly different. If you choose three artists that are different than somebody else's three artists, you're gonna end up in a different place. And so it's, it's kind of an organic way. And it, it starts with your muses, the people that really are doing well in the industry with uh, the part of the industry that you wanna to to uh, start working in. I always say start with the resource books and it's a really helpful thing for anybody to go through. Excuse me, I'm, I need to get a drink here. <coughs> and I apologize, I can't turn my mic off. Um, the three major things you have to think about in educating an illustrator is, or things you have to acquire is you have to have good skill and craft. It needs to be invisible. Almost all working professionals have good skill and craft. You have to understand the ideation process, process, how to identify a problem and solve it in either a narrative or a concept. And you have to understand the industry really well. The biggest mistake I see any young artist make is they build a portfolio wrapped around skill. How is somebody coming out of school, just getting started in the industry, Going to compete with the skill of Donato Giancola or John Foster or Sam Weber or Chris Payne or magnificent artists that have been doing it for a long period of time. You're going to lose that foot race every single time. So you got to make it more about function and more about you um, and make it recognizable. I think it's, it's very important to think that way. Um, developing point of view. Uh, I wrote this document based on what I know about um, Howard Pyle and him teaching to NCYF and Harvey Dunn and the great romantic illustrators of the 19th century. And um, the process is almost the same, except they had lots more time and there was a color study on almost everything. Today, it's kind of, you know, people develop Digitally, color and value are brought together at the same time. So color is not always part of it. I know advertising pieces, movie posters, things that have big budgets and time, they expect to see color studies. Um, different parts of the industry expect to be, see color studies. Hardly ever in a editorial world would you ever do a color study. Um, or even in a book. Or, uh, book cover. <clears throat> there's something that happens in this process. This is an amazing creative process. And if, if we run out of time and me telling this story right here, this will be, to me, my hopefully the most important message and the important thing I'd say to you. And this process has been around for years. I wrote this document and been using it as a teaching tool or, or something similar to it 20 plus years ago. And there's something that happens that makes this really a, an amazing creative process. This is the act of making a picture with an art director for a client. And every illustrator I know does this. Maybe not Brad Holland. He is, that's an old other story. 
but uh, but the act of going through these steps, developing these skill sets that relate to each of the steps. And the thing that where most people mess it up, most people get confused, is they don't trust themselves. And they don't rely on what, what they already know. And so they don't do their thumbnail and ideations, uh, thumbnails from memory. And the very first Illustration Academy we had in 1995, I worked in this process previously for 10 years. I knew every bit, I knew, and it was gonna be the format and the delivery of our, the basis of how we taught at the academy. But I saw something that it, 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 it stunned me and it, I was surprised. I knew every artist that we invited and that included Bart Forbes, Jack Unruh, my father, Skip Lipke, um, Fred Atmos, Gary Kelly and Chris Payne and Anita Kuntz. Those were, that was our first faculty. Every one of them has a great voice, has something that's unique to the way they work and the way they think. And it, I was shocked because they all did this. They all lived and died on this draw from memory. And I didn't necessarily do it that well or that often. But what blew me away was everybody else, the people, the, the bigger their voice, the more they depended on it. And I brought it up to my father. I mean, this was in the first couple of days of seeing this. And I said, Dad, I, I, I'm just amazed at this. And he, he said, yeah, he said, it's something we need to bring up with our students because it's probably the thing that's going to drive them to develop themselves more than anything, their personal voice. And so I want you to think about this. And you think about you do all your design work, you do your ideation, you figure out what you're you know, cognitively going to say, try to say, and you start to pair it with visual in a thumbnail form, and you, and you don't, you, you don't leave your library information, meaning what you know, you, you rely on yourself. It makes the, it makes it so much more creative because number one, you don't have to you don't have to worry, you know, this isn't about polish and finish. You can worry about that down the road. This is about idea pairing with, the, with design. And so you don't, you don't ever leave the creative process. As soon as you look at something, our brains are lazy, we steal it. And it gets further away from you. So if you bring reference to it too soon, you've just, you've killed the creative process. If you stay with what you know, Every book you've read, every every piece of music you've listened to, every picture you've tried to make before in the past, the artwork that you've looked at, it's all there. You have to learn how to go get it. And watching somebody like Gary or my father, or Chris and Anita, it just it it just blew me away and it changed the way that I started making art. And I think it's been very effective and probably the biggest difference in our teaching. Why? why our students have become so <laughs> successful. Um, I'll show you a few examples here in a second, but a few port portfolio tips. Make it easy for the art director. Show only functional images, show recognizable subjects, like Miss Ann's story. Uh, if you wanted, if you want to do celebrity portrait, and you don't have a portrait, uh, you don't have a portfolio fi filled with famous people, you got a problem. It's really difficult to tell if you can do a good likeness if you don't. If the person that you're trying to convince you can doesn't know what that person looks like, so it's got to be a famous person. Um, same is true with story. Um, keep it focused. You can't try to be all to everybody. Line direct mail, social media portfolio, make it cohesive and always be professional. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen some of the most talented people blow their careers by not paying attention to deadlines, um, arrogance, not listening to what the art director. I've had great, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of great art directors that made my pictures better. But every once in a while, you got to draw the line and, you know, one of the things you can't do as a visual communicator is ever look bad. So you fight that battle. And there's times you have to draw the line and you just can't do something if it's going to make you look really bad. Um, you are as good as what you do. Um, one other 
couple more things I can show students. These have been my students. I had the good fortune. I had three very good friends of mine and past students of mine that have gone to have huge success convinced me to go to New York this January to go to the awards night at Society of Illustrators, which I hadn't been to in about five or six years. Um, Edward Kinsella, Leslie Herman, and Sterling Hunley. Um, I realized that they had all won gold medals. The Society of Illustrators gives six gold medals. They have six categories each year. And to think that half of my students, half of the medals went to my students was a pretty amazing thing to me. And, and, it's, all because, and it's all because they developed their voice. They developed something that's unique. This is Vanessa Del Rey. This is <clears throat> Jeffrey Allen Love, Sterling Hunley, Dale Stefanos, Oh Kim Kim, Francis Vallejo, Leslie Herman. And uh, thankfully, I mean, I've been doing this long enough that it's all kind of flipped around. A lot of my students teach with me now. And they teach what they learned. They teach and they they have applied what they learned. That development of voice was so much a big part of that. Illustration Academy, uh, as I said, it's not going to be held this year. This is, if you're aware of Spectrum, this is the cover of Spectrum this year. This is a, one of the, she's not a student directly with me, wasn't. She was a student of George Pratt's at Ringling, is Audrey Benjaminson. But she's been teaching me. I just I discovered her work about three years ago. She's been teaching with me for two and a half years now, and she's amazing. And the list of people on here: Gary Kelly, C.F. Payne, George Pratt, Don Kilpatrick, Sterling Hunley, Bill Carmen, Natalie Hall, Wesley Burt, Vanessa Del Rey, Bill Sinkevich, John Foster, Francis Vallejo, myself, Carlo Ortiz, and Ian McCaig. That was our our instructors for the year, and big bunch of them right now are helping me deliver an online version of it, which I talked about earlier. And our online program is having the same success the Academy has because it's, it's about the same information. And it is about developing voice, getting a hold of skill and craft, learning how to identify a problem and solve a problem, and working on developing yourself. And when I look at this list, Francis was a student of mine. Um, Frank was a student of mine. Audrey Benjamin, kind of. Edward Kinsella was. Sterling Hunley was. Um, Vanessa Del Rey was. And they all have carved out a place in the in the industry for themselves. And it's the objective in teaching. And the way we teach is about career development and to develop yourself wrapped or develop a career wrapped around yourself wrapped around what you want to do and the way that you think so i think that's pretty much it well i do have a i, I guess i have a couple more slides of our illustration program you can go to our website for visual arts passage we have an illustration program and a concept art program they have it's a chain of four classes First class is about skill and craft. The second class is the cognitive side, learning, learning a true ideation process. We make our students commit at this point and tell us who they're making a portfolio for before they get into a portfolio class. And then we put it all together and hopefully an exit portfolio in the last semester. I know that somebody can't accomplish all of this in a year. It takes a year to go through there. These are 10 week semesters, but it's the right information and they can continue doing the practices that they're taught and develop themselves. And many of our students repeat this last class multiple times. So that's it. I thank you. And if you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to, to stick around and answer. That's awesome. Thank you, John. This is amazing. Um, we had one earlier from Sasha. Um, she So I think we all saw there was a, a good mix of, um, of people and um, also landscape within your artwork that you, you did for you. Um, what would you say, what do you enjoy making illustrations 
for the most. Um, As an illustrator, the thing I received the most uh, accolade for was was kind of celebrity portrait of likeness of people. I did a lot of uh, a lot as much as any as as much as most in in a period of about ten years of uh, you know magazine cover. Um, cover things like that and also uh, print collateral uh, were, were it was about it was more about pure image it was more about I, I was not my only concept was mood using you know having a message with mood I tried being a, a more conceptual illustrator for a while and I was mimicking people I was mimicking Brad Holland mostly at least his ideas, not his visuals. And, and it, it didn't, it wasn't comfortable for me. I wasn't good at it. Um, I, and I, well, it's because I didn't really like it. Um, and so I started, I, I saw Robert Heindel go off on this tangent about painting where he just left the illustration world and, and he started this, he called it his obsession with dance. That was, became the name of his print company. Um, and he became a really successful representational painter. Um, I saw Skip Lipke, who <laughs> even changed his name to paint to Malcolm Lipke, um, a very successful illustrator, and he was a better painter than he was an illustrator. Um, so I was signed out. He was a better painter. He was a good illustrator, but he's a much better painter. Um, and then I thought, it's happening. It's this, this, the world allows for that now. It took me about three or four years of pursuing it where I could replace my income, completely replace my income by selling work at galleries. Um, I had a good skill set. I could you know, technically do things. Didn't know what I was going to paint. Um, and I just started painting what was around me. Um, landscape's been really important to me. Trying to do good landscape. I mean, I, I look at it like, like I'm not a big fan of, I know how important it is to do. And I know it was important for me to plain air paint. But I don't find plain air painting that exciting to look at because it's usually a copy of something that somebody's looking at. It's very direct. There's very few people that paint plain air that design at the same time. My favorite landscape painters work in their studio. They recompose what they've seen. That's why I go through all those steps that I go through is because I want to get, a, I want to make my own picture. I'm not trying to do a portrait of a place in the world. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Well, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. This is Jeremy. We have a question uh, from Alex. How do you uh, find out who's a, are directing at publishing companies or publishers? That's the easiest. Go to a bookstore. <laughs> um, um, but more, not, not to be so flip about it. Pick up and look at the Society of Illustrators, look at Spectrum, look in their book section. The art directors want to be there in those books just as badly as the illustrators. Those books were designed as resource books for art directors. Um, I know that, I, you know, in the fantasy side, uh, Lauren Petapento has spoken in our program a few times, and uh, Mark Chiarella at DC Com Comics, and Irene Gallo, Dave Palumbo. I mean, all, all really well-versed art directors. Um, they're easy to find. You, you can find their, their name is attached uh, in those award books. Uh, the, the, you know, I, I send my students out to put this portfolio brief. They have to go out and collect you know, 20 or 30 images from three different artists, and they have to come up with the art directors on all of them. It doesn't take them more than a week to do that. Um, you, know, you look at you know, concept artists, go to you know, write down the names of people that, and the credits of the movies. Um, sometimes you have to rent them and stop them, but, um, you know, cause they can buy so quick, but the, um, yeah, that's, that's information you got to find out and it's information you got to have because it's gonna, again, it's think about, say there's very talented people that are develop, developing skill and craft and putting pictures together and they're being extremely calculated and extremely thoughtful of what goes in their portfolio and they're pursuing it and aiming it at a very high level to an audience, they're going to have better opportunity. And there's people, I mean, I teach people to do that. And I know I have some very talented students and I know that they're, they're, they're going to, they're going to develop, they're, 
going to get started. Um, but you can't you can't just wait around for somebody to you know find you. Um, you have to be very proactive about it. Most illustration, traditional illustration, is bought through direct mail. I, I literally mean that. That's how that's how art directors find out about illustrators. Illustrators market through direct mail. Art directors, I listened to the, the names I just mentioned with art directors. I've had lots of conversation with them. The, the power of a direct mail piece. It has a job to do. It has a call to action. You have to do something. All of them are lovers of illustration. When they see something, they do something. They they you know they get it, they get a card in the mail and think about it. Think about getting, you know, I, I hear artists all, in fact, I have two students right now that have multiple pieces in Spectrum this year. And they're so excited about it. But I, but I, my response to them is that you're in there with several thousand other people or however many people are in there. An art director is not gonna, you know, go to your little quarter page and identify you. That's, it, that's one of the things you have to do. Inner show, send direct mail, follow up with email. Um, the direct mail piece is so great because you have the art director's attention completely by yourself. They can make an un, un uh, what's the right word? Uh, um, unabashed <laughs> uh, or uh, unbiased decision of if they like it or not. Because the, you, you're not on art station, you're not online, you're not in one of the uh, ref, uh, resource books next to 1,500 other artists. And so they can make an honest decision if they like it or not. And if they like it, they're going to pin it to their wall. They're going to put it in a folder and review it later. They're going to keep it around. And you keep doing it. And you and you try to you work your way to where they recognize you. And then you got a chance. You got that's the beginnings of a relationship with an art director. Direct mail is also really inexpensive. Think of you identified Edward Kinsella. He started with twelve art directors. It's the only people he marketed to for three years. They were Art Paul at Playboy. They were uh, Fred Woodward at Rolling Stone at the time. Um, and he ended up working for everyone. It's because he pursued them properly and he had great work. I mean, there's that that's a that's that's a given. You have to have that. But how much does it cost to print a postcard? You know, he only had to print, he only had 12 art directors. He could, and he he did personal. He put them in envelopes. Did personal drawings on them. He did everything to get their attention. Sterling did all, all of the people that I showed you. They all did the exact same process. And that's how most art directors find new talent. And it's the new talent finding them and making them, you know, <laughs> recognize what they're doing. I hope that answers the question. That's great. Uh, just another question. Um, now that we are in the, you know, has, has the age of social media changed the immediacy and effectiveness of illustration? Well, yeah, um, it has. Um, you think about it, there's actually artists. Uh, I have several. Um, right now, I have a student that's got 175,000 followers on Instagram. A student. I have, three th I have 2,300 people following me on Instagram. I, I don't. I, all I do, I've only made 50 posts. I, I have a lot I'm, with the Illustration Academy and the Passage. It's much bigger numbers. Um, I haven't pursued it properly, um, and I don't rely on it. Um, I just show I've made 50 posts, and um, it's not it's not that important to me. The imagine if you are James Jean, or if you're artist that can attract more than a half a million followers that's a built-in audience already if an art if 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 your social media you do a piece of artwork and you post it and it drives a half a million people to the website of that product or that publication or whatever that's a pretty amazing thing it hasn't really gotten there yet there's only a few people that have that kind of clout social media wise but um, generally it's not that helpful. 
Um, I, I would love to see people focus. I, I, you know, I think it's confusing for people that are that are trying to get started in the industry. I, I have people contact me all the time. I, you know, I do a lot of portfolio reviews, and I always ask, "Who are you looking at?" And then I'll I won't know who the people are. I'm pretty aware of people working in the industry. I won't know who they are, so I look them up, and you know, they're looking at somebody that's never done a professional job in their life. And I'm like, "Why are you looking at this person? They have, they've had no success at all." And, I, and most of the time, I don't even like their work. I said, you need to figure out who's doing the best work in the industry and follow them. That's the downside to social media. It 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 makes everybody equal. That's the downside to like, you know, publications that sell illustration. Everybody kind of gets diminished to the same, you know, becomes closer together. Um, standing out is what it's all about. In in you know, identifying yourself. Um, I think it's healthy if you understand that. The job of the job of social media, the job of everything you do, of your your, um, your direct mail pieces, that function is to get you to the website, and so they can look at your online portfolio. And that website better align with your social media, better align with what the direct mail pieces you better send, send it. Art directors, they don't want to read about you. They want to see artwork first. They don't care about you personally. <laughs> I mean, um, I know quite a few of them and they have budgets. Uh, you know, they have budgets for to use pretty much anybody they want. And so they're very selective and they, they look good by, by hiring great people to solve their solutions for them. And it's a very, I, it makes the business very honest. Um, I, I never feel like oh, somebody's buddy buddy with somebody and they're going to hire them all the time. And that might happen because they've worked together and become friends, but no art director is ever going to hire somebody because they're friends with them. They're going to hire them if they can do the job and they're good. And art directors, you know, they, again, they, they don't really care to know that much about you. Uh, they want to know that you're capable of doing the job. Um, I t Sterling and Edward tell me all the time, it's like, they meet maybe 10% of the art directors. Sterling Hunley at this awards night, um, he gave the uh, Dick Engel Award to Eric Skillman. He had won a gold medal with Eric Skillman as art director. It's the first time they ever met, they ever saw each other. And Sterling had done a complete book with him. They had communicated a lot, but they had never met each other. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, the world's a different place. You know, the, the other thing is that it, 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 art, art directors are invisible. They don't, it, location means nothing. A freelancer can work from any place in the world. I've had students that marketed to the New York publishing. In fact, Linda Adair, very good young artist right now. She was living in Australia, marketing to New York publishers. Everyone thought she lived in New York or thought she was an, a, an American citizen. She, she came to the United States for the first time to come to the Illustration Academy. Um, she now she lives in Germany. And her husband got transferred, but she does a lot of fantastic work for American clients. Our directors don't care where you are; they care that you can do the work. Anything else? This is Jeremy again. Well, John, thank you so much. I don't know if anybody else have a, an additional question that you want to post it, uh, but we are. Uh, is everybody asleep at this point? <laughs> Did I bore everybody to death and run everybody off? No, but I, uh, we got some really positive comments here. We really thank you and the legacy that you uh, continue to build. Um, uh, yeah, I should do this. I, I want everybody, hey, you could go there and then join us at the Illustration Isolation. Come and join a free lecture with us and come draw with us on Thursday nights. Um, Jeremy's done it. It's a blast. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you like to draw. So, um, it's fun. Yeah, you guys have done a, a wonderful job starting, uh, you know, to build this community right after, you know, the COVID-19 really uh, hit hard. It has been kind of a refreshing to access those lectures and demos and see how you guys work. and. It's I get I get to hang out with good friends and draw with them and 
Uh, I'm just, the thing that blows me away is I, I go and I look at 200 people posted their drawings the other night. I was just like, that's amazing. That's like a, you know, from a business standpoint of running our online school, that's like a month worth of marketing that we could never get that kind of interaction during a month uh, through social media. And so, you know, people obviously liked it. And, and that's the type of thing you look for all the time. How can you make people, you know, engage in what you're doing? Okay, listen, I want to thank everybody for listening to me. I hope I said something that was a benefit. And, um, you know, if you want, if you're uh, ever interested in talking to me, you can find me pretty easily. So thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you, Jeremy. You guys all have a good night and stay safe. Thanks, you too. Yeah. Let you turn the turn this off because I have no idea how to get out of here. Oh, yep, I can end it for everybody. Thanks, everybody.